So as you're all aware, there's a huge unmet need um, for type 1 diabetic patients, uh, in particular those who are children, uh, in desperate need of a new therapeutic approach. And I think that cell therapy really offers a uh, unique opportunity um, where transplanting a particular cell source can be used to try to control um, the uh, glucose levels. But there are a lot of challenges. Um, so as, as obtaining relevant cell populations matures, and I think we're kind of getting to the point where we're almost there, um, where we can uh, obtain uh, 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 functioning beta cells from human embryonic stem cells, at least um, Biocyte has an approach to do this, and this is, um, uh, there's a number of uh, researchers who are trying to reproduce this uh, in their laboratory so that these cells don't have to mature in the animal, which is really the, the current state. Um, really one of the big challenges is, is how do you maintain the function of the cells and their survival following transplantation for very long periods of time. And so there's a couple aspects of the biology that I think are, are critical to consider when developing encapsulation strategies. And one is that um, the pancreas is one of the most highly vascularized tissues in the body. So this is a vascular cast um, showing how, how um, uh, vascularized, how, how high density uh, the blood vessels really are here. And so what, why this is important is, is for efficient mass transport. So this is to bring glucose in and to bring insulin out. The other critical component of the biology that's important to consider uh, is really the, um, the immune system. And we're going to be hearing quite a bit about that. Uh, we heard it in the previous talk, and I think after um, the, the third speaker will also speak uh, about this as well. And so we really don't have strategies where we can take autologous cells and transplant. We need to go to other sources. And so when we transplant allogeneic cells or xenogeneic cells, um, the immune system is really the enemy. And so we have to, in developing encapsulation strategies, try to find a way of blocking the host immune system from coming in and attacking the cells that, were, um, that are so precious and we're trying to preserve. And so there's a number of very promising strategies um, that uh, have emerged. Uh, one, as you know, is microencapsulation. And so the idea is, and there's many different formats, this is just one format here, where you take um, cells and you place them into a hydrogel material, for example. And the idea is to really block out the immune system, but allow the transport of nutrients and glucose in, and allow the transport of um, insulin out of these capsules. And with this strategy, there's, there's really potential to transplant large numbers of cells. Um, although one thing that one need, you know, one, one big consideration is that um, if you have too many cells, then you can develop a necrotic core because you're not getting enough nutrients. The, the cell aggregates can grow. Um, and if you can't get nutrients to the core, the core will actually die. Um, and then you'll lose function of, of, of the cells. With this kind of strategy, you can add factors <coughs> to try to promote vascularization, um, so you can ensure long-term uh, uh, nutrient supply. Um, so that, that there's a, a lot of interesting strategies um, that are emerging. Um, and, but it's also important to consider that most of these strategies are not retrievable, if you want to remove it or transplant it. So these are some of the challenges that are, are um, are being worked on, and I think one of the greatest challenges, and we seem to be making progress, although there's a lot more work that needs to be done, is that you can imagine that if you have a material here, this material needs to provide so many different functions. So it needs to, to block the immune system, you have to allow nutrients to get in, you have to allow nutrients to get out, um, you want to promote the survival and the function of the cells, and so there's a really long list of criteria that these materials need to satisfy, and um, there's a number of ongoing, very promising work um, to try to develop these new materials, but I still think you know, we're, we're, we're a little ways away um, from coming up with materials that are, are really going to provide the right, um, meet all of these um, criteria for microencapsulation strategies. The other strategy um, that uh, has been around for a while is macroencapsulation devices. So these are um, larger devices, typically a single device, uh, and the idea is instead of using a hydrogel-like material, um, you have a device here where there's membranes. And here's an example here of the Therocyte device, and this is the Encaptra device that, um, from Viacyte. 
And the idea is by um, what you have a, a membrane on the outside that tries to promote um, angiogenesis of blood vessels to come up really close to the, the surface to provide that mass transport that's essential. And then there's another membrane um, that's going to try to block out the immune system but allow the transport of glucose uh, and insulin. And so the nice thing about these, this, these types of um, systems is that you can remove it if you need to or, or um, you, you can retransplant another device in, the, in potentially a similar location. Um, one of the challenges is that they're, they're typically wafer thin. So as I mentioned previously, the pancreas um, is such a highly vascularized um, tissue. The islets have, um, are, are essentially contacting blood vessels. And so in order to provide that mass transport, you need blood vessels are, that are contacting this surface. And if you put too many cells in here, then the cells that are in the middle are going to be too far away from the blood vessels, and you're not going to get that efficient transport, and those cells will just not function well. So this has been an enormous challenge, the scalability. So while these devices tend to work fairly well in most models, when you move to a human, where the human has probably 100 times more blood, um, you know, just an enormous um, scaling challenge, uh, you need to provide many, many more cells. And so we've seen very promising results in animal models, but the scalability challenge um, is, is enormous. And so here I show that if this is a therocyte device, you'd need approximately 4,000 therocyte devices to, be, um, to equate to the number of beta cells in a human pancreas. And so while the current approach uh, is useful to potentially avoid hyperglycemic levels, so if you transplant a small number of cells um, they, and they secrete insulin when glucose is present, um, then that may, might help to just um, reduce the, um, those peaks to a more manageable level. Um, this really is not a cure. And so what we're trying to do in my laboratory is to develop an approach that we refer to as the med-free approach. Um, and we refer to this as the macro encapsulation device with flow recirculation enhancement. And so to give you some perspective on what we're trying to do here, um, I have this uh, demonstration that one of the postdocs in my lab put together, um, which is drinking tea. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with drinking tea. And to give an example, we have on the top diffusion alone, and on the bottom we have diffusion and convection. And so when I show these videos together, what you'll see is that when we have diffusion alone, so typically when you make tea, you put the tea bag in first, and then you pour the water on top. And you can see that this gets the tea moving around um, in the hot liquid. Whereas on top here, we see diffusion is happening very slowly. So this is kind of the current device. And only when you remove that, when you provide some convective transport, do you actually get a lot of the tea to go into um, the hot water here. And this is essentially an analogy I'm trying to make to describe the current devices, which, is, which are entirely based on diffusion, and the convective devices that we're trying to um, develop. So we're trying to take the current system and figure out a way to provide um, active convection within the system um, so that we can bring glucose into those cells more quickly. We can get um, the beta cells that we've transplanted to experience levels that are similar to what's in the interstitial fluid um, and then have the cells respond uh, much more quickly than the, the current system. And, when, and, and also one of the benefits of this approach is that when the glucose levels start to drop, you want the cells to stop secreting insulin. Um, otherwise, you can reach a hypoglycemic level. And so we think that a convective approach um, could be useful to, um, for, for this type of response as well. So while macroencapsulation approaches have been promising, um, the progress has been really, really slow. Uh, and there's been a number of reasons for this. One is lack of academic funding in this area. Um, so I don't know if there's ever been a request for proposals by NIH or, or other governmental agencies to work on devices like this. Um, there's few companies who are making the macro encapsulation devices, and the ones that are are not distributing them. Um, and the ones that are available um, are really rudimentary and extremely expensive. So it's been very difficult for academics to work with these macro encapsulation um, type devices. 
And there's so many different parameters to optimize in this system, um, the material, the pore size, the geometry, surface properties, and these can impact all kinds of things like the response rate to glucose, um, as well as the impact on angiogenesis, what we want, blood vessels right up against the surface of the device versus fibrous tissue, which we don't want, which will slow the response rate. And so, um, so where we're headed with this technology is to develop um, model devices that can be distributed um, to the JDRF academic community um, with tunable properties. So we think this is one of the, the key kind of outcomes from this project is, is we're gonna develop scalable um, macro encapsulation devices that are going to be cheap um, and that are going to be very easy to tune and change the properties that we can um, distribute. Also, we think that this could be useful like the, the current approach that Biocyte and some of the others are pursuing uh, to try to avoid the highs and lows um, of the um, of, uh, uh, glucose levels. And we think that by providing convection, there may be an opportunity here to really pack a lot of cells in this device, which wasn't previously possible. And if we can do that, if we can transplant enough cells and provide them the nutrients required for survival and also have very quick response rates uh, to respond to the glucose and then to stop secreting insulin, um, at the right time, this may end up being um, useful uh, as a cure. And so for this, uh, uh, technology for this project uh, in my lab is um, Owen, who's a medical device engineer. Um, we're working closely with Dale Greiner, uh, who's a beta cell transplantation immunologist, um, or at least that's what I refer to him as, uh, and Doug Melton, who's a beta cell um, biologist. And so we're very excited to um, um, be working on this project, and hopefully the next time I speak with you, I'll have um, some results to, to share. So what I also wanted to do is just to take an opportunity to tell you about some of the other technologies that we're developing in my laboratory. Um, and uh, we work in five main areas. Um, one is in cell sorting. And so this can be useful to try to capture circulating tumor cells, for example, from the bloodstream, which exist often in very low frequencies. And so if we can capture them, and not only capture them, but then release them, we can study which drugs would be most um, useful to kill those cells, and that would be um, quite useful for targeting metastasis. So most, most patients, um, it, uh, most cancer patients die from met the metastasis, not the primary tumor. And once the tumor is removed, you really have no way of biopsying it. So if you can, but the cells that are at the metastatic sites continue to spit cells into the bloodstream. So if we can capture those cells, um, that could be quite useful. Uh, and we also do a lot of work in the area of drug delivery. We have inflammation responsive uh, drug delivery systems that we're looking at treating osteoarthritis, for example. Um, we develop needles that sense, um, that, that uh, are based on a mechanical clutch, so they automatically stop when they get to the right um, location. We do a lot of work with adhesives, um, so these are, um, which I'll, I'll get into in a, in a moment, adhesives that we can place inside the body, uh, and then also um, targeted cell therapy, so delivering cells in the bloodstream and targeting them to different sites in the body. So to just go into this in just a little bit more detail, um, for tissue adhesives, we've been very interested in, in understanding um, how the gecko is able to walk on walls and hang from a single toe, and the gecko has this um, hierarchical design on the surface of its toes so it's, they have these lamellae, which are about the same length scale as our fingerprints, but if you look at higher magnification, these are hairs, and even higher magnification, these are nano projections. So a single gecko may have on the order of um, a, hundred, a billion, actually, a billion of these nano projections if you count them up on the surface of their toes. And this can um, maximize the surface area of interaction with a substrate and increase the level of adhesion. And so we've been inspired by the gecko and some other creatures in developing patches that can attach to different tissues in the body. And I'll just give you an example. Um, so some of the images I'm gonna show might be a little um, gruesome, so I sh should have warned you before switching the slide. Um, but the next slide is gonna be a bit gruesome. Um, so here, what we've done, so our initial adhesive that we developed actually wasn't strong enough to, for, for particular medical applications, so we, um, the one we published on 
maybe four years ago. So we spent some time trying to enhance the level of adhesion because we want to solve clinical problems. And we got to the point where we could create a hole here in the colon, a fairly significant size hole uh, in the rat colon. Um, and we attach our patches as a very dynamic wet tissue. Uh, we come back seven days later uh, and a pretty good measure whether that um, patch remained attached is abdominal adhesions. Um, so the patch we see is still attached. We don't have any abdominal adhesions. In the case where we don't put a patch down, um, we get these massive adhesions that occur. And we can see the mucosa appears to be um, healing here. We've also been developing another approach um, where we have a photocurable glue um, that can be used for internal procedures in the presence of blood. Um, and this is a case where we have, um, this is a rabbit heart that we've taken um, and set up in a Langendorf model. And this heart um, is, it will continue to beat for five or six hours in this system. And what you'll see here is that we can apply our adhesive patch to the heart um, with five seconds of light and this will attach fairly strongly. Um, this is an initial prototype, so we used too high an intensity of light, so we did some damage to the heart, but our more recent um, prototype does not, does not damage the heart. So this is the patch that's attached, and then what we can see is that, looking at, the, at how strongly this is attached to the heart, we can try to remove it with tweezers, um, and it's very difficult to, uh, to remove. You see it's really strongly attached. So to take this one step further, and that this is probably the most gruesome thing I'm gonna show, so uh, what we did is we created a hole in um, the um, rat heart, and so this was a two millimeter hole, fairly large hole for the rat, and we, what you'll see here is that we closed it with just a single suture, we put a patch on top, and we removed the suture, um, and, and we show that we can seal this hole. So it's a really difficult, um, environment for adhesives to work. And the reason why we're, we're doing this, so here you see we're making the defect here um, in the heart. The reason we're doing this is because we're interested in developing technologies that can seal holes um, in the hearts of babies. You've heard of probably septal defects. Babies are born with septal defects. Um, and devices that are available are really tailored to the adult. So here you'll see this is a suture. We're just closing it so the animal doesn't bleed out. Um, and then we place the adhesive on top uh, we cure this for a few seconds. Now this was actually a case where we didn't get a complete seal, which may be more representative of what happens in the clinic. Um, so there's still a little bit of uh, leakage occurring here. So what we did is we came back with um, our glue and we attached our glue here, you'll see, and we, we don't even, so we remove this suture. Heart's still beating, which is good. And then we apply some extra glue to this site. And we don't even wash away that blood. Most adhesives available in the clinic now um, do not work well in the presence of blood. This is a major um, challenge. And this adhesive um, does, that's, that's how we've designed it. Um, and you'll see that we end up getting a perfect seal here. So this is um, closed and the animal does fine. Um, we've also shown that this can work We're on- We're here to learn about diabetes, please. <laughs> right. <laughs> So we've also shown that this works um, to, to close blood vessels. Um, so this is sealing the carotid artery. Uh, and um, we think that this technology could be really useful in a number of surgical settings to, to solve uh, um, many, many um, problems. And we're working with Pedro Del Nido, who's the chief of, pediatric, uh, chief of um, cardiac surgery at Children's Hospital. So one other thing uh, that I wanted to show you was a, um, a tape that we developed um, so this is a, uh, one of the big challenges in neonate units. A lot of the work that we do is kind of tailored towards children or, or babies. Um, one of the big challenges is that adhesives that go on the skin um, are, are made for adults. And these need to secure devices to the skin. And when they're removed, they actually cause significant damage to, that, to the skin. And so this is actually one of the biggest problems in neonate units. Um, and so here's an example of all the different tapes that are being used, um, temperature probes, EKG leads, um, trait tubes. And so, um, and this is an example of some of the injuries that can be done when these tapes are removed. Uh, and so we developed a, um, a new adhesive to try to solve this problem. Uh, and I have just a, a short video to play. Um,
that I think. Welcome to Inside Science TV. For most of us, tearing off a bandage is no big deal. But for a newborn in a hospital, it can be a very painful experience. The current tapes that are used in the neonate units are designed for adult skin, not for sensitive, fragile skin like that of uh, premature babies. Preemie babies lack the tough top layer of skin called the epidermis. Medical tape can rip off the more delicate lower layers of skin. Now, bioengineers have developed a new bandage tape that's pain-free. We are very interested to develop a new type of tape that could secure devices to the skin, fragile skin, um, but be very easy to remove. The tape has three layers, a backing, a middle, and an adhesive layer that sticks to the skin. The middle layer has a grid pattern etched in silicone material with a precise thickness and chemical properties on its surface with just the right amount of stickiness. When removed, the backing peels off, leaving a sticky adhesive. We could simply add baby powder to it to detackify it so it's no longer sticky. Origami paper is delicate like a newborn skin. It's used to show how traditional medical tape tears the skin. Here, the new tape leaves the fragile paper intact. For our quick release tape, when we apply, we can remove as quickly as we want and we induce no damage. It could help the 1.5 million patients per year who are scarred from medical tape. Science creates an ouch-free solution to a painful problem. I'm Josh Lebowitz reporting. So what the um, postdoc in the lab who was working on that project received the uh, technology review 35 for this, um, for this project. And this uh, technology is in the process of, of being translated to the clinic. So one more thing that I'll show um, is another technology that we've been working on, um, which is inspired by, by porcupine quills. The North American porcupine has 30,000 quills that are released from a predator context animal. In contrast to the African porcupine, the tips of North American porcupine quills feature microscopic barbs. We wanted to gain a deeper understanding of how these barbs contribute to penetration and adhesion of tissue. Data from experiments like this one revealed that barbed quills require 50% less force to penetrate and exhibit four to five times stronger adhesion. We believe these dual purpose barbs will lead to the bioinspired development of new medical devices such as easy penetration needles and chemical free tissue adhesives. So this is a new adhesive approach that um, we recently developed, and here's a patch of these um, porcupine quill-inspired um, uh, design, and you can see the, the level of um, adhesion that we're getting with this, this type of system.